morning. The time is now 9.34 and a quorum of the board is present. State Board of Education meeting of November 12, 2019 is called to order. The first item on the agenda is the approval of agenda and order of priority. Are there any items board members would like to add or delete from the agenda? Hearing none, may I please have a motion to approve the agenda and order of priority? So moved. Okay, Second. moved by um, Board Member Ramos Montigny, seconded by Board Member Pritchett. Um, is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. This time, Marilyn will introduce the members of the State Board of Education. Good morning. I'm Marilyn Schneider. I'm the State Board Executive. You've just been listening to the State Superintendent, Dr. Michael Rice. He also is chairperson of the board. To his left is Dr. Cassandra Albrich. She is the president of the board. She is unable to attend today's board meeting. And next to her, you will see Dr. Pamela Pugh. She's from Saginaw. She's the board's vice president. Next to her, Ms. Michelle Fecto from Detroit, the board's secretary. Ms. Nikki Snyder from Chelsea, Dexter, from Dexter. And she's a member of the board. And next to her, Tiffany Tilly. She's the board's NASB delegate. It's their association. Uh, Carol Lougheed is the Michigan Teacher of the Year. She's unable to attend today. The weather tripped her up a little bit. And across the table is Mr. Josh Nahart. And he's from the governor's office, who serves as an ex officio member of the board. Dr. Judy Pritchett is next from Washington Township, board member. Lupe, Ms. Lupe Ramos-Montini from Grand Rapids, board member. Next to me, Mr. Tom McMillan, the board's treasurer. He's on his way to us from Oakland Township, and he will be arriving shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, Dr. Kenneth Schneck, please begin the new employee introductions. Sure, thank you, Dr. Rice. So I am joined by two new employees uh, within the uh, Division of P20 System and Student Transition. I'd like to introduce Terry Patterson. Terry uh, is with us and uh, works in the Office of Great Start uh, in the Child Development Care Office. Terry, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, my name is Terry Patterson. I'm working in Child Development and Care in uh, Great Start Equality, and I've been employed with the Department of Education for about six weeks or so. Oh, Terry, thank you. I'd also like to introduce uh, Tony Mallett. Tony uh, also works in the Office of Great Start. Uh, she works uh, within the Office of Early Childhood Development and Family Education. Tony, you want to share a few things? Mm -hmm. So I'm Tony Mallett. Um, I am from Grand Rapids, Michigan. I've been with Michigan Department of Education for about six years. I'm a family engagement specialist um, for the Office of Great Start. And that's great. All right, thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Kyle Garant, if you would continue, sir. Uh, my uh, uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Brenda Swetman in our Office of Health and Nutrition Services. Brenda, can you tell a little about your work here at the department? Hi, my name is Brenda Swetman. Thank you. I also have the pleasure of introducing uh, Penny Kentish McWilliams, who is in the uh, Office of the Superintendent. Can you tell a little bit about yourself, Penny? Hi. I um, am the Senior Education Consultant, and I have the pleasure and opportunity to work in Genesee County with the Genesee County schools and families that were impacted by the Flint lead crisis. So I feel like I am home. I grew up in the, the community. In the Flint School, I was the principal for several years. I was the board president for um, almost 10 years for um, county schools in that area as well. And um, I look forward to supporting uh, those families in individual. Thank you. Do we miss any new employees in the room? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, There's one. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome. And do we have others? Any others? 
No? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, if you plan to offer public comment today, uh, please complete a form and get it to Maryland. Forms are available on the table just outside the boardroom, and they must be submitted prior to the beginning of the portion of the meeting devoted to public comment. Public comment will begin immediately following the lunch break scheduled for approximately 1 p.m. today. Please be here at that time to make sure you have an opportunity to comment. The first item on today's uh, Committee of the Whole agenda is our presentation by students and staff of the Early College Program at the Lansing Community College. The Early College is a collaboration between Ingham Intermediate School District and Lansing Community College. The Early College is a program for students entering their junior year of high school who are looking for an opportunity to move into a college environment. We welcome students and staff from the Early College Program who will share more information. Lending support from the audience are Mr. Jason Melema, Superintendent of Ingham Intermediate School District, and Ms. Mickey O'Neill, Chief Communications Officer for Ingham ISD and Eaton Regional Education Service Agency. Dr. Kenneth Schneck, will you begin the introductions? I will. Thank you, Dr. Rice. And thank you uh, to the State Board of Ed for allowing um, some students and staff from the our early college at Lansing Community College to join us this morning. Uh, as we've heard, Dr. Rice is very committed to involving students in our board meetings. And so we have some students here to talk about um, a very innovative program that's not too far uh, down the road called the Early College at Lansing Community College. With that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Steve Rosales, and Steve is going to take it from there. Good morning. I'm Dr. Steve Rosales. I'm the director of the Early College at Lansing Community College. Thank you for inviting us to share the success of our program. Matt Booby and Tony Greenberg are here with four of our students to give you an overview and to hear from a student perspective of how the program is benefiting their future. I now turn it over to Matt and Tony. Hi, my name is Matt Booby. Uh, I teach and I mentor, I teach social studies and I mentor these students at, at the early college. And again, thank you for having us here today. Tony Greenberg, uh, I'm the English teacher, also a mentor at the early college, and I'll get started with, a, with an overview of uh, who we are and what we're all about. We exist as a shared educational entity, as you heard, between Ingham Intermediate and Lansing Community College. Um, the second bullet there is, is a huge part of what we are and what we do. Uh, we're located on the main campus of Lansing Community College, and we think that the power of the site is, is very important, that we place the students on the college campus. I mean, that has a, that has a big impact on them. Um, 17 participating schools and uh, districts, primarily in Ingham County. We are one of 20 early middle college high schools in the state. You know, there are 142 additional early middle college programs, but we are one of 20 um, high schools of that sort, and we do belong to the State Association of Middle and Early Colleges. Um, we're in our ninth year of operation, having started in 2011. So our model is not like every model in, in the state. We take students after their 10th grade year. Uh, they come to us through a public lottery process from our local school districts, and they stay with us for grades 11, 12, and then that 13th year. Um, like other early colleges uh, nationwide in this state, um, we, we do target um, the lottery process towards um, getting first generation and low income students um, access and, and helping them have success in college. Yeah, we reserve a third of our seats in the lottery seats. process for, for that group in particular. So what do we do? Uh, in three years, we move students from high school to a college credential. So we have a college and career readiness uh, we approach, right, that, we, that language everybody uses. But what do we do? We have, we have soft skills that we teach the students. We call it success skills. We have a college and career readiness curriculum that... Uh, includes, you know, exposing students to um, industry, to various jobs, to panels of, of uh, professionals that come in, a variety of things that we do with college visits. Uh, we teach them college knowledge, what it means to go to college and what's required of them. Obviously, we're teaching them the, the Michigan Merit curriculum, the high school content, and then the mentoring that's something that lasts all three years, right? So we're connected to them um, for three years with the same instructor, and that, that's a huge piece of what we do. We'll yeah. talk more about that in a bit. Probably the backbone of what we do to help students get ready for college and career is what we call success skills. You'll hear people usually call them soft skills. We, we, we kind of coined the term success skills because they're going to help students be successful. And we do this through explicit instruction. 
in my social studies class, in Tony's English class, in our math and science classes, we give up time of instruction to explicitly teach about these skills that we know students need. We do this through activities, discussions, uh, videos, and I think the biggest one that, that students are asked to do kind of for the first time is, is a self-reflection. Reflecting on who they are as a student and what their strengths are um, and, and where they need to improve. And, and some of the success skills that we specifically talk about are on the, on the board there, like attendance. And, and then for us, it's more than just showing up, though showing up's a great first step. It's about how do you be mentally present in class, how do you take good notes, and teaching students those skills explicitly. And communication, teaching students how to communicate appropriately in class, through writing, with, with us as instructors, with their eventual college professors, and probably the biggest one on there is time management. We know that when students go from high school to college, like the biggest issue we, we see um, is time management. Um, so we talk a lot about time management, both, both in the first semester and in the second semester and, and throughout the second and third years, and that guides a lot of our, our mentoring uh, that we do. And, and this success skills becomes kind of this, this language that we use throughout those three years with our students. Which, which brings us to mentoring again. I mean, that the success skills we keep circling back to, right? It, it, it guides the language of what we do. And so part of, part of mentoring is um, helping students continue to implement those, those things while they're in college classes. Um, each student is assigned to one of four instructors at the very beginning of their time with us. And you know, we meet with them one-on-one -on -one from that very first semester all the way to the end. We teach them you know, we help them in, in their academic skills, personal issues come up, time management comes up, we're looking at their planners, teaching them how to use, how to use one appropriately, um, helping them navigate this whole process, everything from the transition out of TEC to what will come next, whether it's the world of work or moving on to, um, you know, another university. Um, we serve as, a, as an accountability piece for them. Um, you know, various struggles they, they encounter along the way. It's, it's a way for them to stay connected to TEC as they're out there as an individual at that point. Um, we provide external motivation for them. We help them find internal motivation. Um, and, and, and it's one of the things that at the end of our program, their families and, and their students will say it's the mentoring uh, that, besides the free credits, which they enjoy, <laughs> the mentoring was a huge part of what made them successful at the end of TEC. I mean, we, we exist for student success. There's a picture from uh, one of our graduating classes. At the end of this the year, we have a convocation. Uh, and this is usually the day before LCC's graduation. So if you see, they have medallions on. And, and at LCC graduation, the next night or two nights later, they get to wear these medallions. Um, graduation at LCC is a really cool event for us. We make up less than 3% of LCC's population. But in any given year, we usually have about 20% of LCC's Associate of Science degrees. I think it was 28% last year, in fact. So um, our students are having great success, um, and, and we're just here supporting and celebrating their success. And of course, we're always reflective on what we do, um, we continue to try to get better. And so you know, over the last five years, our, our college course pass rate just keeps getting better. Um, so you've heard from us. You're going to hear from the students in just a second. We thought a parent voice would be um, appropriate as well. So this is a, a short video um, that, that gives a parent perspective as well. Fingers crossed it works. Come on. <laughs> Maybe. Or, or not. Or not. <laughs> Technology. Let's leave it. that. <laughs> Let's move to Brooke. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I can tell you that parent was really excited that his student <laughs> was, uh, I've seen this video a lot, a lot of times. Uh, that's, that parent was particularly very excited that his student was no longer in the basement playing video games and was actually goal setting. Um, and another, stu or another parent we have on the video was really excited that her student was doing a lot of college and career planning um, and, and just really excited about the students planning, you know, years, years in their future with us. Yeah. Oh. Take our word for it. Yep. <laughs> I promise. I promise that's what they say. <laughs> and now it's not going anywhere. Or stuck. Yep. All right. So we have four students with us. 
Um, we have uh, a third year student here, Brooke Hill. So Brooke, would you, you know, tell us, tell them about you and your success. Hello, my name is Brooke Hill. I'm from Eaton Rapids. Uh, I'm a third year student here and I'm studying chemical engineering. Um, this program has been so beneficial for me. It didn't only prepare me for school and college, it prepared me in life. It prepared me for getting my job, buying my car, all that kind of stuff. Um, the mentoring has been very beneficial to me. It helps me make sure I know that I'm on the right track and I'm doing what I should be doing. Um, it's been very, the beginning was very rough from the start and it helped me grow a lot faster than I thought I would. I matured probably I five or ten years. I think it's really important Sorry, to kill that. Ask. He would, you know, I, uh, he would just yeah. basically go to school and day to day he really didn't have Sorry. any plans, but now he actually makes a schedule. Yeah. I have this I have to take. <laughs> Sorry, Brooke. Okay. Um, I matured probably five or ten years in the three years that I've been here, and I feel like um, being on the college campus has helped with that and um, just having more responsibility put on myself. Hello everyone, my name is Elijah Fink. Hope everyone's having a good morning so far. I'm a part of the EC17 cohort and I'm studying engineering and design. And I feel that TEC has definitely prepared me, like Brooke said, it's matured me way faster than I feel like I would have without it. Um, I was able to acquire a lot of the soft skills that TEC implements and I feel like it's helped me put me in the place that I am today. Um, mentoring was also a big part of it for me, even though I might not have always been there. Whenever I did, I was able to get a good one-on-one -on -one <laughs> with my uh, mentor and that definitely helped me put me in the right mind space to continue moving forward. Um, I just finished an internship with a 3D printing company called EOS North America and got certified for using those 3D printers. And then I also continue to go on to a four-year college and then continue engineering design, possibly get a job with that 3D printing company as well. Hi, I'm Zari Payton. I'm coming from the Okmos Public School District. I'm in my second year of this program, and I'm studying a, a general associate's degree of science to hopefully go into um, business administration and a psychology dual major. Um, for me, coming into this program wasn't an ideal choice because I didn't want to leave my high school. But um, with the push from my mom, I came and the first semester I was very hesitant to get out there and meet new people because I didn't want to be in the program. But with the success skills, I feel like that really helped me figure out like this is the program I want to be and be able to finish all the three years so I can get those 60 credits to be able to transfer to a four-year college. And the success skills also really helped me because I just came back from a um, HBCU tour, which is historically black colleges and universities, um, two weeks ago now. And during that tour, I heard from a lot of different student perspectives, and I learned how most students in college in general, they drop out after the first semester because they don't know how to manage their time and do school and work and still have time for themselves. And for me, I feel like with this program, I gradually continue to learn and uh, improve on those skills because of the SES skills that they teach and keep implementing in our um, mentoring times. And so I'm really excited that I do did this program and I'm thirdly year. Hello. I'm Benjamin Perry. I go by Ben most of the time, you know, unless I'm I feeling bet. fancy. So uh, <laughs> I came from the Okemos Public Schools, and I was only there for a couple years. So when I saw the flyer for TEC, I was like, you know, I guess this would be an interesting thing to try. So I did, and uh, it was a good choice because now I'm a semester and a half, a little bit less than that, away from an associate of the arts. Uh, transfer associate of the arts and I plan on transferring to a four-year university and spending a couple years finishing my bachelor's. I want to get a bachelor's in accounting 
and probably my CPA. I mean, yeah, I'm definitely going to get my CPA. And uh, <laughs> uh, I also have interest in government, and so this experience has really helped me um, explore these different fields uh, with the college classes and the atmosphere. You know, professors come in, and they're from different, uh, different career paths and different uh, places of work. And so these things just um, really allow me to connect. I've, I currently, thanks to meeting new people and working at the Learning Commons at Lansing Community College as a tutor for accounting, just the intro course, but uh, next semester I'll be also tutoring the next level course. So uh, TEC really helped me recognize that my success is in my hands. If I want to do something, I need to do it. And it gave me the ability to seek out the resources necessary to take that success. So, yeah. <laughs> Questions from board members? Dr. Pritchett. Thank you. First of all, thank you for coming today. Um, I'm familiar with the early college models and the different kinds of models across Michigan, and I think it's a phenomenal program. In fact, I think every student should be exposed to this environment in one way or another. But just so I'm clear, um, and, and I believe you mentioned it, um, students basically transfer to this high school at the end of their sophomore year if they've made the commitment for this early college program. Um, they don't continue to go back then to the high school where they attended their freshman and sophomore year for extracurricular activities or et cetera. Um, I was a volleyball player at my high school, mm -hmm. so I still did play volleyball. My um, junior what would have been my junior and senior year there while I was in this program but um, that was the only thing that I did just played yeah. sports yeah. I, I also wrestled too so it's very um, easy to go back and forth if you need to but I think it just um, it depends on how well you're implementing the success skills of like time management because for me, I'm in my second year, so I'm technically a senior, and so I still do um, National Honor Society with my school. I still do track and field in the spring, and I also still, um, I'm a committee chair for the student body government at my school, so I'm still able to do um, all of those activities for my last year, and it just um, makes, it's just making sure that each activity that you do, that you have certain days or certain times that you know that you're going to make that commitment to go back and do that program at your school, but it's doable. So they maintain their high school. They, they, their diplomas will come from their home high schools. Um, we just Almost, take them okay. for those three years onto our campus uh, okay. full time. All right. So the classes that they take are taught by um, professors at Lansing and also staff at the high school. Kind of 50-50 or? They, they don't go back to their high schools to take classes. So we're high school instructors. Right. And so we'll teach them the high school classes on LCC's campus. And then okay. once they're ready to take college classes, um, and we do that through a credentialing process, then they will go take college courses with those professors, yes. Okay. But they're with us full time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yep. Okay. And, and Dr. Rosales, maybe you could explain the difference between early college and early middle college for our board? Sure. Uh, Early, early middle colleges, uh, there, there's, like I said, there's several different types of models. That are, there's lots of programs that are schools school within schools. And so our model is basically where we're, we're, we're independent and, and on, the, on the college campus. So that way we can get that total immersion and get that, that college feel right from the, from, the, from the first day that they step the foot on the campus. So, so what's the difference is that one may, may be on the high school campus, and our, but ours is on, the, on, on the, uh, the college campus. So in early middle college, they may be they, they may they may have a foot in curricularly both in high school and college. With early college, with your program, it's two feet in college. Correct. Okay. All right. Very good. That's a very good general. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Please. Uh, that's a very, very good uh, observation. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, board member Ramos Montini. <laughs> good morning, I, and thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, I was telling one of my colleagues when I went around saying, giving greetings to everyone, that I would look for an, a, an event that makes my life eventful for that day. And you guys started that event for me today. I, I salute all the young people. You're very articulate. 
Uh, I salute the instructors. Uh, this is awesome. Now, in, in I, one of the things that I do in Grand Rapids is um, solicit funds for scholarships for students. And we're becoming a 501c3. And one of the uh, ideas is to start earlier than college level, it, it, starting in ninth grade. So I, I would welcome your input as we, we're going to be call ourselves the community to honor Cesar de Chavez. And so we would, I, would, I, I would like to invite you later when we do become to come and present to my group what you're doing because it's phenomenal. And this is something that uh, we want to start within this group. And so your seed will blossom and help a lot of other people. Uh, so I thank you everyone for your presentation today. Well, member Fecto. I, I second all the accolades um, and thank you for being here. Um, the question that I have is um, with regard to children who might not have transportation and really want to get into the program, are there provisions <coughs> to provide transportation so that all have access to it? Let's say they're parent is working during the day or, you know, it just doesn't work out where they would be able to be transported. Are there a, a, a plan to make sure that those kids are included? Uh, yes, we don't, we don't provide transportation, but we do a lot. We do uh, get CATA bus passes for our students that are, that are in our area. So that way, if they, if they have an issue, like you just, like you just mentioned, where they have a parent that, that, that has to leave earlier for work, they are able to at least get to the, to the bus stops and be able to get, and, and it drops off right in front of our building. So. Okay. And it goes to all the places where the kids are coming from that feed into the program. Most parties, ma'am. Okay. To give a sense of how well that's used, we, we have students who have come to us from as far as Munith, if you know where Munith is, down Stockbridge School District, mm -hmm. um, which is, I mean, Munith is pushing toward Dexter, Michigan. Um, and those students would hop on the rural route and, and nearly a two-hour ride to get to us every day um, that would take advantage of that. Um, so it was a small investment on their part, and then they'd be able to use that CATA bus pass, I think, once they got into Lansing um, at the South Penn Meyer, if I remember correctly. And we've had numbers of students do this um, since we started back in 2011. So we, we give out quite a few of those. It doesn't answer every um, need, but it does answer a number of them. And another thing that we do um, quite explicitly at the beginning of, of the year is we try to line students up to set up um, carpooling and, and ride sharing to get them to do that with with one another. And, and a number of them do it, actually. Yeah. And I had another question about the, just so I understand the funding. So the money that pays for the classes comes from the, the, um, the, the per pupil allowance. Right. So that goes... From, so the school is then transferring that money in total to the... 97%. Um, huh? 97% comes, comes to 97% comes yeah. over. Okay. And that's, and that's done by the, the, by the intermediate school. Does that put a limit on how many kids per school can come? Or? Uh, some districts are... They're, they're, we, have, we have a lot of seats for each... each uh, participating school, but and some districts they decide to say to send more than what they have. So we have several. Ninety-seven percent. The three percent uh, stays, the stays uh, for volleyball and wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> and prom. Yeah. Uh, and, and the prom. The prom. That's, exactly, that's exactly right. Although I think the prom is is a, is a, is uh, funded in a different uh, fashion. Doctor Pugh. Yeah, that was one of my questions. Thanks, okay. uh, Michelle. And just another thought, uh, Brooke. I'm happy to hear the uh, engineering, and uh, I did chemical engineering, and I also did. I was I did dual enrollment. Um, so, and at that time it was kind of unique, uh, but it was a, a tremendous experience. Uh, and so, uh, thank you all for your presentation and, and what you're doing here. The only thing that I think was a drawback, but I was able to, to overcome, but just something to, to think about is that like a field like chemical engineering, by the time I was getting to Florida A&M, the best HBCU, by the way. <laughs> but by the time I was getting there, I was in 
calculus three, I was in PCHEM. So, you know, it was uh, really tricky there trying to live a college life. Um, a real college life, what I'll say, and then also maneuvering being that advanced because I had already taken all of those classes, especially in a field uh, such as chemical engineering. Uh, so just some, some thoughts on that. I know that you're preparing the students to be on college campus, but they're not. To me, I still don't see it as that real college experience that they will have once, once they transfer first. So thinking about how they balance uh, those those things there. So any thoughts on, on that or? I was going to say from experience, um, I, feel, I felt that high school did not prepare me at all for the college, the college uh, life. And joining early college definitely prepared me really, <laughs> really fast too. Um, I remember first semester was very tough for me, but um, everything, every place is going to have a different experience, but at, this, at the end of the day, you're still going to be going there to learn. So I see what you're saying, as in, yes, it's slightly different, but we're still in that college environment because LCC is still a college. So I do agree, but also kind of disagree. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's something to over that you definitely can overcome, but just thinking about the ramping up, you know, that you're going to be in those. One, one of the things that we do do is we do college and career readiness events. And one, and one of the events that we have them do is actually take them to a, a, a large college, a medium college, and a private college. So that way they get an opportunity to be on the campus, other than our campus, or the campus at LCC, and get an opportunity to talk to other students. And tour and get a tour guide of, of, of what's happening there. So they, I mean, it's not it's not the full immersion or the full uh, taste of it, but at least they can see and say, I feel I feel better on this campus, but I don't feel better on this campus. And so to grow off of what Elijah said, um, I when I came to the early college, I really immersed myself into the college campus. So um, while it may not be like an officially large campus, like I have a job on campus, I'm helping teach my fellow students. There's people that are, um, you know, age like years older than me that I actually help with classes. And uh, I just, I felt really prepared to go out into the college environment. Um, this year, students from my grade in high school are joining the college and I've actually been helping some of them. Like when they come in, I'll be like, hey, how are you doing? And if I see they're working on homework, I can give them tips on how to, you know, manage their time more. And uh, so I felt pretty prepared for the college environment. And I'm ready for, um, I think I'm ready for a four year. And you get what I'm saying. It's just that you might be in Calc 3 and your your dorm mate might be in, you know, something far, you know, where they're just able to get an opportunity to get their feet in the door. But I think I hear what you're saying. You, you, you feel that where you are now, you're getting that environment. You're preparing yourself already for the environment that you'll be going to. So best wishes to you all. Um, our students were really impressive today, board, and um, yeah, they, they, they represent um, not just strong um, examples of this program, but strong examples of programs across the state. Our young people increasingly are involved in programming, not simply in high school, but in college. Uh, we've increased our dual enrollment. We've increased our early college, our early middle college, our career and technical education programming our advanced placement programming, our IB programming. We'll share more of this in the coming months as we help to fully display what's going on in Michigan public education rather than narrowly display it. Our young people are the best advocates for uh, Michigan public education. We appreciate them. We appreciate our staff coming and drum beating around this outstanding program and uh, doing so on a day that was little challenging from a weather perspective <laughs> but after all this is um, this is Michigan it is not Mississippi and uh, we, we expect a little bit of snow even November 12th thank you very much thank you for having us it's snow in Mississippi too it does it does but that's that's for a different reason yeah yeah that's enough about climate change yes Next item on the Committee of the Whole Agenda is the update on accountability systems. 
Michigan Department of Education continues to work on implementing the statewide system of accountability measures, letter grades, and rankings specified by Public Act 601 of 2018, adopted on December 28, 2019. Uh, here to share uh, briefly with us on this uh, and to help engage the board in a continued conversation on this issue and ultimately the finalization of this system is Dr. Vanessa Kiesler, Deputy Superintendent of Educator, Student, and School Supports. Before Dr. Kiesler begins, however, let me just share with the board that uh, we will be presenting category by category. Uh, discussion will take place. The board will vote on a number of categories today. The remainder will be finalized in December either by the State Board or if still unfinished after the December Board meeting by the Department. Are there any questions from Board members? Um, hearing none, Dr. Kiesler, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Rice, and good morning, Board members. So as you all know, we have been in a months-long conversation regarding the A to F system. And so we wanted to pause for a moment and just remember where we've been and where we are now. So just recalling where we've been, PA 601 was passed in December of 2018 during lame duck and was signed into law by then Governor Snyder. And at that point, the department began months of discussions with the US Department of Education to understand to what extent that new law could meet the requirements of the Every Student Succeeds Act. By May of 2019, it was clear that the state system could not meet the requirements of ESSA, and we escalated our design efforts around the A to F system. So while work had been occurring, uh, we really escalated those efforts around May. Uh, the legislatively required peer review panel was nominated by Governor Whitmer during the summer, and the MDE began discussing the A to F system with a focus on the elements that we've been focusing on, those decision-making discretion elements, um, with this board in August. So right now, the State Board of Education has reviewed our initial A to F work and has provided some decisions and lots of feedback to the department. Both the department and the State Board have reviewed the recommended cut scores from the Standard Recommending Committee. Uh, we've also reviewed the report of the legislatively required peer review panel. So using these inputs, what we're going to look at in this presentation uh, represents the State Board of Ed input and the proposed cut scores. Just a brief reminder to everyone about how the grading scale or the cut scores that you see uh, came to pass. So what the law requires is that schools have to be assigned certain grades and certain labels. Um, what, where the cut scores are or what makes an A, a B, a C is decision-making discretion. So a cut score is that number that separates one grade from another. It's, it's a grading scale, essentially. How do we determine a cut score? <coughs> um, we utilized, the department utilized a process to develop recommended cut scores, which included an independent facilitator, a panel of educators and other experts, to develop definitions, use data, and produce recommended cut scores. That legally mandated peer review panel did review these proposed standards and cut scores and wrote a report. Um, it's important to note that the peer review panel was not given authority to approve, but to review, and that's what they've done with the report that they made available at, in, at the end of October. And then we need to, at some point, approve these cut scores, which is decision-making discretion. Saying just a bit more about the independent facilitator, we engaged the National Center for the Improvement of Educational Assessment to facilitate our, our cut score workshop with that standard recommending panel. Uh, the center, as it's more, known more commonly, has done this kind of standard setting with five other states. So they're a nationally recognized independent voice uh, that can help us with this process. We used a committee of practitioners that had 11 individuals, and that committee met twice First, to establish those performance level descriptors, um, which are the definitions of what the different grades mean, and then to look at impact data and to recommend cut scores. So at this point, we'll move into these recommended cut scores. Starting with on-track attendance. Um, 
On track attendance means that a student misses fewer than 10% of, the, of their school days. So the numbers in the table represent the recommended cut scores. Just reading from left to right to make sure everyone is on the same page. If a school had between 94 and 100% of its students with on-track attendance, meaning they're missing less than 10% of the days, they would be given a, quote, ranking label of significantly above average. A note on these ranking labels. This is required in law that there are three elements that be assigned a ranking label. And they're called ranking labels even though they don't actually rank. Um, they're really just more descriptors. And these are the names of the required ranking labels. So all of this is prescribed in law um, that this category have a ranking label applied to it. So again, returning to the chart, if a school had between 94 and 100% of its students on track attendance, they'd be ranked or given a significantly above average. 88% to 94% above average, 76.5% to 88% average, 55% to 76.5% below average, and any school with below 55% of their students uh, with on-track attendance would be significantly below average. And using these cut scores, we have roughly a third of schools above average, a third average, and a third below average. Board members, um, any, uh, any discussion on this particular category? Again, we're doing this category by category through. We're, uh, as we did at the last meeting, we're banking decisions uh, as we go. Uh, so you're making decisions as we move forward, uh, narrowing our focus to the, the few items uh, left to uh, discuss in December. Questions on this? Yes. Just a quick question about what we already talked about. Above average, average, and below average equates to how many numbers of days missed. I think we talked about that, right? Um, so any student who misses fewer than 10% of days is considered on-track attendance. And then this metric counts up the percent of students in a school who are on track. So if you had, um, it doesn't directly translate into days missed. It translates into kids missing less, percent, less than 10% of days. So like an above average school, between 88 and 94% of their kids would have been in school at least 90% of the time. Okay. Which roughly translates to, did we say 18? Right. So 10% days? of days is 18 days in general with a standard calendar. And that's above average. Um, if a school had between 88 and 94% of their kids missing 18 days or less, mm -hmm. they would be above average. Ish. Okay. Yeah. So um, this is unchanged um, from our previous conversation. Um, any additional question or discussion? Any additional question or discussion? If not, hearing none, um, could I have a motion to move um, this particular set of cut scores? So moved. So moved by uh, Board Trustee Ramos Montini. Do I have a second? Do I have a second? Uh, I, I had a very quiet second from uh, Board <laughs> Member Snyder. Um, any additional discussion? All in favor? I have a question. Um, um, just so I'm clear. Question so from if we Board approve, Member Fecto. So we, if we approve this one piece, yes. then um, when we discuss the, the, the whole as a whole, does it mean that we, it's, we cannot come back to it if we approve it? As it's it's hard to come back to it and wrap the wrap the December the December piece. Um, I, I'm just I'm just curious to see how. The I'm not whole sure there's I'm not sure there's an interrelationship. Remember, there are three ranking labels. There are five A through Fs. Um, the ranking labels are we're moving through the ranking labels initially. We're moving through the A through F subsequently in today's conversation. Um, we have a goal of hitting all of them today uh, minimally to make sure that we know where we are uh, with any additional information that we need to provide the board um, in December. Um, roughly, we've ordered these um, from um, least involved to most involved. Okay. So the, 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 these, 
I will trust you that this is the, the, that they don't interact. I'm just um, okay. All right. It, this really, this really is a standalone metric to your, okay. I think, to your implicit question. Okay. It is a standalone metric. All right. And then the weight that each metric has, is that a discussion as well? It, it is, it is, um, well, the, the eight don't relate to, to one another, but there is a, a metric that we talked about, mm -hmm. the comparison with similar schools, where um, we amended, based on board input, the way in which we compare similar schools. So we, we included... Um, a revised definition of economically disadvantaged, narrowing it from free and reduced price lunch to free lunch. We increased the percentage associated with that factor. We also added um, a special needs percentage in. Um, and, and so those were areas where we amended the way in which we determined who the like schools would be. And yes, that is part of the presentation um, and, and an important part of the presentation uh, from my vantage point, yes. Um, Dr. Pugh and then Ms. Snyder. And I think I'm, you're going to repeat what you just said and maybe what you said even previously. I just want to make sure I know how we are voting on each of these sure. rankings. Sure. So, the so it's, a, it's, a, it's a separate <coughs> vote for, for each of these metrics. Ultimately, um, as the board is aware, we have a responsibility under law to have a five-letter grade, three-ranking label system. And so um, you have the opportunity here um, to shape this. We welcome that. As you know, I felt strongly about that. I felt strongly about it for months. But at some point, um, this system has to be landed. So we're going to do all that we can do collectively uh, through the December board meeting, at which point, if there are any outstanding decisions, um, the department will will make those, and we'll move forward in order to um, wrap this by uh, the deadline that uh, interim state superintendent Alice um, indicated in um, in the spring of of 2019. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Good. Um, Miss Snyder. And just to be really clear, because I want to go back to the first few slides that you read off of. There was a panel of appointed advisors and then also an, a, a group of 11 educators, <laughs> which were considered expertise practitioners in the field. Yes. So these are the recommendations here. Sort of like this is a foundation, this is where we start, and we can always have further discussion. Correct. It's a good point. And in this particular case, there was no movement off of that recommendation. There was in other cases. There was not in this case. And by the way, the movement off of those recommendations was movement that, um, that the board participated in. So, and we'll footnote that as we discuss later in this discussion. Any, um, uh, Dr. Pritchett. Thank you. And I'm probably getting way ahead of the game on this, but my understanding is that each one of these labels and grades will have some sort of a descriptor for the reader. Bless you. For the individual who is looking at them so that they understand how this particular, you know, what does significantly above average mean? So the, so the, so the answer is yes. There will, there will be a descriptor. Rec recognizing that these labels are, um, are a little bit mind's eye, right. like that uh, different people have different perspectives of what different labels mean. But we will describe each of the labels statistically, so minimally people will be able to understand statistically what they mean, irrespective of whether you agree with how any of the labels was defined. Okay? We, we acknowledge the board is well aware of the peril of the definition, that we believe strongly in providing all of this information publicly. We do through the parent dashboard. You have for many months provided this, for, actually for a couple of years, provided it through the parent dashboard. And so this is not about uh, transparency at all. This is, a put, this is about putting a label or a series of labels 
on top of that transparency because the transparency already exists and has existed as a, as a function of the parent dashboard for a number of years. And that was your doing board. You put forward, you created with the department a parent dashboard and made all of this information available. This puts labels on um, a, um, a series of uh, statistics. And um, you could argue that that's good. There's some people that do. You could argue that that's bad. Certainly, that's the position of the, of the state board. Um, and I'm not trying to relitigate that now. I'm simply saying that um, all of the information that undergirds this has been, has been available. OK. Um, do I have any more questions, any more comments on this metric? Uh, Mr. McMillan, welcome. Uh, we are on on-track attendance. Um, number um, slide number six. Um, hearing no other questions or comments, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Guys have it. Uh, oh. I'm sorry? I'm still abstaining. Okay. All right. Very good. So we have uh, all eyes with the exception of Dr. Pugh, who has abstained. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kiesler. Moving on to assessment participation. So this is the percent of students who are assessed on the state assessments. Uh, recall that by state and federal law, you are required to assess all students. And we hold schools accountable. And we're held accountable as a state for assessing 95% of students. So while the requirement is all, we put some error in there, you know, some room in there for below perfect, I guess. So 95% is the expectation schools are held to. Um, on the chart, you see the recommended um, cut scores. So any school assessing between 96.5 and 100% of their students would be rated significantly above average. Um, any school assessing between 94 and 96.5% of their students would be above average. 91.5 to 94% would be average. 86 to 91.5 would be below average. And any school that assesses below 86% of their students would be significantly below average. And given that the vast majority of our schools do test more than 95% of their children, roughly 90% of schools are above average or significantly above average on this metric. Board members, questions? Uh, Mr. McMillan, actually, you want to know something? Let's do, let's do this, um, if we could, to engage the conversation. Let's, let's get a motion and a second and then do the discussion. Uh, if board ultimately does not want to vote on the metric today, that's fine, not a problem, but I think that's proper. Um, so, so do I have a motion? So moved Second. by Ms. Fecto. Second by Ms. Ramos-Montini. Um, discussion. Mr. McMillan. Um, well, I mean, I, I've uh, voiced this in the past, but I'm, um, I know there are parent groups out there that actually um, encourage uh, opting out of testing and um, well actually I needed to ask the first question this is simply the state one one test um, any of the state assessments the state required assessments so the MSTEP or the my access for students with significant okay. cognitive disabilities okay. um, so yeah I mean I I don't blame you know I think there are some kids that uh, you know have problems taking tests uh, you know that uh, there are others that uh, would argue that, you know, the tests are not transparent. Parents can't get to see what's on the test. They're not sure, uh, you know, if there's some, if it's appropriate, if it's, uh, you know, I, I think there's so many problems that I, you know, wouldn't, uh, I'd like to expand it so that, uh, you know, that, I, I don't know, I just, I, I guess I'm not as, I'm not as concerned about uh, the level. I know that there's a f federal law. I don't think they've ever taken money away for, uh, you know, for lower than the uh, 95 or whatever the feds require. I'm glad there's local control. I keep hearing it from Washington. I like to, I think uh, when we're talking about what's best for our kids, maybe they ought to uh, put their money where their mouth is. And so at any rate, I, not to, I wouldn't mind if saw this going down a little bit and maybe 90 to 100 and is the top one and 80 to 90. And Dr. Dr. Kiesler, if you'd be kind enough to share with us broadly what the distribution is currently. Mm -hmm. 
So, um, like I said, the great majority of schools are actually significantly above average, um, over 85%, and then approximately another 5% are above average, and that gets us to 90%. So most schools are above average or significantly above average. Yeah, but if we change those, I think it would send a message that uh, the board isn't all that, uh, you know, we are understanding of parent groups and others that are concerned about these tests, and um, we're not going to you know, penalize them or even you know, give them a bad quote unquote grade. Other, um, other thoughts on this, uh, on this metric? Dr. Kiesler, remind us, this was um, the recommendation of the standard recommending panel? It was. It was, okay. Rec recognizing what Mr. McMillan said, that 95% is the federal standard for, for testing, and um, that we hold local <coughs> schools to that uh, federal standard um, that um, I agree with Mr. McMillan. We've not seen a cutoff of state funding um, from, the, from the feds. One wonders if that would ever uh, take place. Nonetheless, it is the federal standard, and it is related to um, all of our title funding. Um, and so we, uh, we flouted at our, at our peril. Um, the board should be aware, though, yeah, the, the board should be aware, though, that uh, we are not here having this discussion because of the feds. We are here um, having this discussion uh, because the state legislature passed uh, this law. This is not a function of the federal law. This is a function of the state law. So that I would encourage you, uh, to the extent that you have a problem with this um, exercise slash law, I would encourage you to uh, locate it at the locus of the problem, um, namely uh, the entity that approved this in December of 2018. Um, any other questions or thoughts on this metric? Yes. Just to clarify, this assessment participation, will any of these, um, because of the state law, I'm not talking about ESSA, do not apply to special education center programs and do not apply to alternative schools, mostly high schools, but there are some other. So they won't get this label. Correct. Any of them. Correct. Correct. So the, okay. just to say, again, what Dr. Pritchett just said to say back, the state law uh, requires that a, a special ed center programs and alternative education schools, which to your point are largely alternative high schools, but there are some other ones, um, do not receive any of this. They're exempted from this system. Other, um, other questions? And, that, and that's, an important, that's an important distinction for the board to re-recall because um, we have um, all schools in here now. Um, so these numbers are going to lightly uh, move on the margins when we remove alternative education schools, when we remove special education centers from our, from our numbers. That's really, really very important for people to understand that there is a difference between, a disjunction between um, the federally approved ESSA plan, the index system, and uh, the state of the state um, A through F system. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so the state law requires us to um, assess the participation rates. The state law requires us to assess the, to to um, to include this metric as part of the, the system. Five letter grades, three ranking labels. This is one of the three ranking labels. Typically it's required. Required, yes. Okay. Yeah, we would never, we, there is no way that we would ever put a ranking label on, um, on assessment participation for every reason that Mr. McMillan noted and, and then some. Um, we would just simply never do it. it. You could have very, very different schools um, with very different populations operating in very different ways. Um, and, and I might add, this is arguably the simplest of the metrics. 
and it's still um, um, with some measure of challenge associated with this. Again, I think all of these, these numbers, the raw numbers, ought to all be available for people to see and to make their individual determinations about. But to draw judgments about specific schools broadly based on individual <clears throat> metrics, I think is really very, very challenging. Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't recommend it. I, I also had a question. When you say the alternative schools, do you mean some of these privatized schools that handle um, adjudicated youth or, you know, I'm thinking like Wolverine up in the thumb or is, are those the schools that were, that are opted, that are opted out? So to be an alternate education school, you have to meet several criteria. You have to be labeled as such, you have to label all the kids in the school as alternate education students. And there's a third one that I can get Chris up here to answer if you'd like. But So any school that is serving kids who meet a certain definition or providing education in a certain way. So I believe Wolverine probably is one of those because it is a, a adjudicated youth school, but we'd have to, I'd have to double check the list to be sure. But it's pretty stringent. You can't just be like, I'm an all ed school. We, you have to label, you know, you have to provide some documentation. So we're sure that anybody who's an all ed school in the data is actually an all ed school in reality. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Yes. I, I just um, uh, can't, get you, can't uh, let you get away with uh, Dr. Rice kind of passing the buck uh, to the legislature. They said we have to do this. They did not say we have to make it look like this. Uh, so. They gave us the discretion, and this is, we don't always have, we don't have very many decisions uh, on, at this uh, table. Um, a lot of them are very important, the ones that we do have, but the, here, you know, we have arrived at a time where we have some discretion, and, you know, this table has, this board has said that we're not a fan of these assessments. Uh, it tends to bring right and left together in many ways. Uh, there are certain groups that want accountability and want something very rigid and treat all kids the same and, you know, cookie cut and they like this kind of stuff. Uh, there's others that for on the right who don't like Common Core and they don't like the Common Core line tests and so they say we want our kids to opt out. On the left they say that, you know, some, they want opt out for other reasons but, uh, and maybe some of those reasons as well. So it, this is an area where, you know, uh, we don't, the feds say 95%. Uh, that's fine. That's feds. But here we have a decision to make, and uh, I'm going to propose an amendment when it's when it's appropriate. Fair enough. Um, so other um, other thoughts. All right. So um, so you have a distribution in front of you from the standard recommending panel. Um, its distribution would have 90 percent of the schools either significantly above average or above average. Um, at this point, Mr. McMillan, if you would like to recommend um, an amendment to the initial motion, yep. that, that would be, um, this would be the time. Very good. I'd like to amend it to make uh, basically uh, significantly above would be 90 to 100, above average 80 to 90, average 70 to 80, below average 60 to 70, significantly below average below 60. Okay, if we can just slow down because uh, there are going to be... Well, it would just be in, yeah. in increments of 10 like they do at yeah. schools. That Fair enough. Are, you know. But there are, there are ramifications Sorry. to the uh, distribution. And um, although there can't be profound ramifications to the distribution because the distribution was already significantly weighted toward um, above average, 90% being well, well, wait, above there's average. Wait, no, there's no second. You don't, there's no discussion on the motion until we have a second. No, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to give Dr. Kiesler a little bit of time to um, help us with um, distribution. Well, if there's no second, then there's no discussion anyway. Fair enough. Um, do we have a second to the motion? We do have a second to that motion. There you go. Okay. All right. So, um, Dr. Kiesler, if you could advise us roughly on um, what this means in terms of uh, uh, change? Uh, I, I can, so, sorry, I'm not trying to stutter here. I want to actually grab my computer and our tool that allows me to look at distribution. Uh, in general, this will be almost everybody, um, almost everybody will get significantly above average. If you take 90 down, thank you very much, Scott. If you take 90 down, because 90 was in the middle of the below average cut. Um, so that'll leave us with only um, the 5 to 
anything but significantly above average. Okay, so this would take us from 90% um, above average, either, either the top two categories, to 95% in the very top categories. Yes, roughly. Okay, all right. Um, any questions on the can math I, of that? Can I give my, can I uh, address my motion? <coughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think that I understand that, uh, you know, that it's already distributed quite to the left anyway before my motion. If this were to pass, it'd be even further to the left. I understand that. But it really is about what, what we're saying schools can do in the future. It's not what it is today. We would be saying that, look, if you want to uh, do what parent, a lot of parents are urging you to do, we're fine with it. Now, you, we're going to have problems with the feds if everybody does it and we get below 95% as a state. But if you local district want to go down to 80 or down to 90, 91 or 80, you're still going to be above average. We still understand what you're doing. We uh, agree with much of your reasoning. Um, and so districts, uh, I'm not talking about what the distribution is today, but I'm talking about future and what it's sent, the message it sends, not just a message. I'm not doing things just flippantly for a message. I think it sends an important it tells the districts, importantly, that we understand that these tests do not measure accountability. They are not something that should be, you know, the be-all, end-all, and that for, you know, by all means, that they, every kid has to take it. If there are parents that don't like it, don't think it's appropriate, want to see what they are before they take it, uh, and the law doesn't allow them to see the questions, well, then fine. You know, I, I think that they ought to be able to do it, and this, this, just the way that I've done with my motion would make it so that they're not, as, they're not the, penaliz the penalizing, the being graded below average or significantly bo below average wouldn't, wouldn't fall upon them. Okay, so um, I appreciate the, the explanation. Any questions for Mr. McMillan or comments more broadly? Ms. Vecta. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm really sympathetic to this argument. Um, the only caveat that I have is I remember stories um, in Detroit when people would talk about test scores in certain other districts gaming the system by having their low performers stay home to give them an edge on the on it. So they would use the dis discrepancies and and selecting who would take the tests. Um, <clears throat> so that's that's uh, in the back of my mind. Although I think I don't know how that would work. I'm not sure what the penalty is for being on this, how much it weighs into the overall um, weight. There, there, there really isn't. And, right. I mean, it's important to understand these are standalone metrics and, um, you know, the, the individual label assigned to the individual school right. is whatever any individual person wants to um, wants to make of it right. yeah so uh, to put a just to expand that because this is the you've asked the question twice there is no overall anything right. there's the five and the three and they stand alone so unlike some not. other systems we've talked about in the past 10 years some of them did sum up and what they each weighted mattered right. that doesn't happen here okay so this doesn't do anything besides have a label on it and it stands by itself okay does that help yep okay mm -hmm. Other, uh, Dr. Pugh. I'll just say, I, I'm um, unlike what Tom is claiming to be, I'm Bless not you. above being flippant to send across the message. So this is probably the only one that I will not abstain from. So I will support this. Okay. The, uh, the amendment. Okay. I don't think I'm being flippant either. I, I am. <laughs> Very good. Okay. So, um, okay. so the motion on the table is to uh, move from... Um, the recommendation as initially presented by the standard recommending panel to um, 10 percentage point bands, 90 to 100, 80 to 89.999, 70 to 79.999, and so on and so forth, the consequence of which is to move from 90% significantly above average or above average to 95 percent 
It would actually be 98%. I've got my tool. 98%. 97% would be significantly above average, and 1% <coughs> would be above average. So 98 total. Very good. Between okay. those two categories. So that is the, that is the um, we are voting on uh, Mr. McMillan's uh, amendment. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Yes. Uh, and, and we have Ms. Ramos Montigny uh, abstaining. Um, so, um, like the first vote, uh, unanimous, save for an abstention, the abstention this time uh, being Ms. Ramos Montigny. Third uh, category, Dr. Kiesler. Oh, no, we have to vote. That was just my amendment. Oh. I amended the motion. Fair enough. Um, all in favor of the amended motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Um, I still abstain here. Um, I, abstention. It, I'm, I'm all confused because we had conversations of all of this in those special meetings, and I thought we had settled all of these questions. So I'm totally um, confused. I didn't hear his. Uh, uh, so, no, so I cannot vote for something I'm confused with when I thought we had all settled what we were we supposed to say. Behind, behind, right. behind, behind no, closed we doors. Were, <laughs> I hope we were yeah, and I think, I think um, <laughs> in, in fairness, just for, from a clarity yeah. perspective, um, we did share extensively with the board in uh, publicly noticed small group sessions. Uh, board members participated in those. Um, publicly noticed small group uh, sessions. There was no um, significant conversation about this category at that time. That is correct. That is correct. Could I, can I add to it? Yes. Because, you know, my, we were presented with information and we, were, we gave our feedback um, generally. It was very much general, but we, we never received a final document to vote on until today. I just didn't That's right. see this until today. And there was no majority. I think yeah, it was never too. majority. So it was more like <laughs> this know. is this is what you know the Understood. information is. And the, right. Okay. Yeah. Third category. Okay. Okay. This is the third category, the subgroup comparison. And remember the goal of this metric appears to be to give a school a label based on how well their or how how well they do with their subgroups overall. And so we had extensive discussion at the October meeting about combining the subgroups. And so at this point, this is a combined, this, is, this combines all the available subgroups. Essentially what this metric does is it looks at each subgroup and how much it's below the state average. And it assigns them a, a score. One means you're, you're right near the state average. Two means you're below, kind of bad. And three means you're really below. And then it sums them all up and gives you an overall distance from the state average. And then these are the cut scores. Where this gets weird is the required ranking labels use the word average, and the metric is also comparing to the average. So it becomes a little bit uh, circular. But what these cut scores mean is any school with a one or low, like a, a one, would be significantly above average, meaning they, they are right near the state average with their subgroups. Their subgroups perform near the state average for subgroups. A school that gets from a 1 to a 1.25, it means there's still their subgroups are pretty near the state average. A 1.25 to a 1.5 means they're getting further from the state average, but they're still kind of not that far from it. Uh, 1.5 to a 1.9 means now your subgroups are kind of performing below the state average. Um, and if you have a score of 1.9 or greater, because this goes up to a 3, your subgroups perform well below the state average. I think we think one of the important things with this metric is that roughly 85% of schools receive a label of average or better, uh, meaning that their subgroups perform relatively close to the mean performance for the subgroups for the state. And we acknowledge that this metric is a challenging one. You know, we've had several discussions about it at the board table, so um, we leave that statement there alongside our numbers. Other, um, so if we could, um, just to follow what we've done with the last two metrics, um, if I could have a motion to approve. So moved. Um, moved by Ms. Ramos Montigny, second. Second. Second by Ms. Fecto, discussion. Well, I guess Dr. I'll, uh, Dr. Oh, I'm sorry, good. That's okay. Um, okay. 
So we have school A, and well, first of all, the magic number is 30, right? To have a subgroup have count a subgroup. in this, okay. yes. So they have more than 30 ELL students, mm -hmm. uh, and they have more than 30 special ed students. You're going to combine those two and then compare it to the same two at the state average. Almost. We would say, what's your EL performance relative to the state average Okay. for ELs? For ELs. And if it was, let's say it was just right on par, it's just at the state average, they'd get a one in this ranking of one, two, three, one meaning close to the average, two meaning far, moderate, and three meaning far. So they're a one for EL. And then let's say they're students with disabilities. We look at the state average for students with disabilities, and they're far below. So they get a three for that. Okay. So then we would average them out over the two. So to speak, then we would combine and say, okay, you got a two-ish. So you've got this one that's well below and one that's on. And they'll never be compared to school B. Their, their, right. That it's all, number is their yes. own entity number, yes. period. Their subgroup and their school relative to the state mean, and then all of that summed up, and then it's put on this distribution. This isn't one that compares to other schools. It sounds right. like the comparison to right. similar schools, but it's, it's very different. It is, it is a comparison by subgroup mm -hmm. in whatever subgroups count for that school with the state average for those subgroups. So if you are a homogeneous school, um, that is to say, if you are a school that is all something, you may count in only a category or two. If you are a more diverse school, you have more categories that count, this becomes a more complicated metric. This is arguably the peril of the metric. It is arguably the downside of the metric. I might add it's been the downside of metrics for 17 years from No Child Left Behind on with a series of accountability systems that, um, that for all intents and purposes treat those schools that educate more diverse populations um, in a more severe way. But that's the way, that's the way this works that um, if, if you have under 30 of a given category, that category does not count for you. Under 30 special needs kids, category does not count. Under 30 English language learners, the category does not count. Those categories drop off, and you are compared only with those categories in which you have 30 or more young people. Right? Assuming they test it. 30 or more uh, people that have tested. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. That is a, that is a, a, a good distinction. Because when you get around Thank the number 30, it gets... It, yes, ma'am. It fluctuates sometimes. That, correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, other, um, other thoughts? Mas preguntas? Pensamientos? No tengo. Gracias. Yes. Uh, Performing, so it, when you say those who have taken the test, that's the particular, you know, MSTEP or, okay. But I mean, remember, remember, this is, this is um, almost exclusively uh, test-based, and you can only count those who have tested. Right. Um, that, that's the, that, that's the, you know, that's the case with proficiency, that's the case with um, growth, that's the case with this particular um, metric. Um, with English lear learner progress, it's a little bit different. It is with a, um, an assessment, but with, it's with a different assessment. It's with WIDA as opposed to, um, to MSTEP or MyAccess or, or mm -hmm. MME. I, I guess I'd be remiss into not, because I, I, this is an area that I'm not as uh, well up on is Michelle and some others. Uh, as, as far as the subgroup, I understand there, you know, here again, we have discretion. So I'm wanting to understand where our discretion is before I vote. Uh, it doesn't have to be 30, is that right? Nobody, there's nothing in state the, the law end, that says the, 30. The, end, the, end, the, um, the state law does not say 30. No, okay. but the, uh, so, but the, if I could please, okay. the, um, but the ESSA um, accountability system does. Right. And to change N, the, the sample size, if you will, the N, 
um, is a more fundamental change. And that's not going to be done uh, this go round. If you want to uh, reflect upon that for the next iteration for next year, we're happy to have that conversation. There are people in the department that would argue in favor of a somewhat smaller sample size. Um, there are others that would argue in favor of a somewhat larger sample size. This is very technically yeah. complicated. Right. It deserves a full hearing. That, that's yeah. fine. I just wanted to make sure that those that are more attuned to these is this issue um, are, hap are comfortable with this. Because uh, I don't, yeah, I understand. It could be lower, it could be higher. I just, is and, 30 and the right one? Because we have discretion. Uh, I'm just, I was just told that it couldn't be done now, but I, I yeah. think that with computers and with enough okay. people and I know right. organizations that can turn ships around pretty quickly. So, if, if I could, though, this is not a ship. And we are trying to the best of our uh, capability because we've argued um, that there is a uh, substantial difference between the index system and the A through F system. We've argued um, uh, you can't have it both ways. You can't both say it's a problem for them to be so distinct and, oh, by the way, we're going to make them as distinct as possible. The SS system has an N equals 30. Um, I'm happy to rethink that absolutely have no issues rethinking it at all. But to rethink it on the fly is to do disservice to the technical complexity of it. And it really is technical that, you know, to go to, go to an N equals 20 means that every child is worth 5% conceivably, um, whereas currently at N equals 30, basically every kid can be worth um, 3%. Um, that difference can, can throw things fairly, um, fairly profoundly. Um, again, not that it's an unreasonable conversation. I think it's a completely legitimate conversation. We're happy to have the board in the conversation. I know I'm happy to have the conversation, but it does, it should be fully vetted. Um, Ms. Ms. Snyder, then Ms. Fecto. Make sure I understand the, the 85% and the average. What is the range in M-step scores that that ish represents, kind of like the days with the um, first metric. So what that translates into is that about 85% of schools have their subgroups that perform not vastly different than the average for that subgroup statewide. So that it, it would doesn't change. What? Like the, the average of each subgroup yes, range would, it would. change. Absolutely so you can't it would. Just throw it out. I, yeah, there isn't a good corollary into a, a score. But it does mean, again, it, about 85% of schools, their subgroups don't look or perform vastly different than the average statewide. So basically six of seven hang close to yeah. or are slightly above yeah. the average. Their economically disadvantaged kids in their school okay. perform near the average for economically disadvantaged kids statewide. And we're saying that's the average for this cut score. Does that translate to M, the way MSTEP says this score means this? No, not exactly. So with MSTEP, I'll use economically disadvantaged again. In general, in the state, our economically disadvantaged subgroup performs 20 to 25 percent lower than non-economically disadvantaged. So if you're, um, and that percent is if you're proficient or not. So in general, like statewide, if 45 percent of our students are proficient, the economically disadvantaged subgroup is usually around 25, 20 percent proficient. So it translates into at the at the kid level, that proficiency, are you proficient or not? Mm -hmm. um, the kids aren't, we don't use these labels anywhere but this system. We don't use an average label with kids on the M-step. They get the proficient, you know, and they get their scale score. Okay. I know it's, a, it's, I know it's a bit of a hard answer. I'm trying to help with the but, it just right. translation like of metrics. Yeah. It, it yeah. is a hard answer, but in fairness, it's a hard metric. Yeah. It, it's the most challenging of the metrics. Um, and, and it is the least intuitive of the metrics. The other metrics are, I, I think anyway, more, more simple to understand on their face. Um, so, I, you know, I don't find fault in either the question or the response. I just think it's a, it's, it's a hard area to understand. That's my perspective, okay? And, and I know this from personal experience. I've been on the questioning side in other meetings. Other, um, Ms. Fecto. There was a there was some pretty heated discussion about lowering the M score, and um, but my concern is that 
these are test scores, high, you know, high stakes standardized test scores for kids. And I don't think the tests are a valid measure. You know what I mean? So it's sort of like the, the opt out thing. If it makes less pressure on these kids to take these tests and have their worth measured by these tests, um, you know, I, I, especially kids who might have learning disabilities, to, to use a test to measure, I don't think that's a good measure of success for them. So I, that's why I, I kind of, not as um, strident about lowering the end score for those reasons. Yeah. Any other, uh, Dr. Pugh? Uh, this is something that I shared. You know, I really, it, I, my, I've not fully thought it through, you know, what this looks like. But I guess looking at how we're combining all the scores, and I've shared this with you, and I'm, yes. I'm thinking about um, just the research that shows that African-American students being taught by African-American teachers fare better. And so I'm just wondering is, if once we combine all these scores, is would that tease that out if, if that were the case? And are we going to look at these individual scores to see what's going on, the categories, uh, to see what's going on? Um, we can certainly share that with individual schools. Um, such a high percentage is above average. You, you know, we're sitting 85% at above average in this metric, it's hard to imagine that the label is going to have <clears throat> much helpfulness associated with performance or with practice in an individual school or district. You might find, as we discussed, that there is something around test results or graduation rates or college going or college continuation or college completion that's related to the factors that you're talking about. And I'm very familiar with this literature, and increasingly people in the department are as well, because I'm drumbeating around the importance of a more diverse staff. We are not diverse in our teaching workforce, as you know, in the state, and, as, and we need to do better. Right, and as we're talking, you know, hopefully someone, I don't know what else you can do with the data. I know you have to be careful with that, because I'm thinking about, like, some regressions where you're not just looking at descriptive data, but I would like to know... Um, uh, an Asian student who uh, is high in poverty, how they would fare and how they're faring in some of these di districts. Looking at some of the confounders, mm -hmm. I, I would like to, I mean, that to me that would, and we all know this, but looking at, at some of that information, um, if, if you have all of these data points, um, being able to look at, at the information in that way, would, again, we, we know this. I, I think there is tremendous utility in what you're talking about. I also think that it's involved. I would welcome your participation in it with us because um, what you're trying to do is to data mine to drive higher student achievement in particular districts. I think there's some real value to that. Um, some of what drives higher student achievement gets mitigated or, or completely overwhelmed statistically by other factors. So a, a district that educates a more diverse population um, of children, a larger percentage of African-American children, for example, a larger percentage of Latino children, may also have fewer dollars per kid relative to need. And so the latter factor could overwhelm the former factor, and it could appear as if the former factor has no impact. I refer you, and you, I think you know this study, the Johns Hopkins study says that uh, if an African-American child has a, um, a teacher of color uh, on or before his third grade year, in or before his third grade year, he's 13% more likely to graduate uh, from high school. Two such teachers um, in or before uh, the end of third grade, 32% more likely to graduate from that's a big deal, and um, that is with pretty rigorous regression analysis, and um, I think we ought to be referring to that, drum beating around a more diverse workforce as a result. And I'll just say this, because as, as you're talking, it reminds me, you know, as a public health person, if I did a research study that showed that smokestacks 
uh, were in an area, mm -hmm. and then these are cancer rates. And I put that data out there as descriptives, <laughs> and I drew a conclusion <coughs> that it was because of the smokestacks that, and those smokestacks should be closed, that the cancer rate, I mean, the cancer rates are high because of the smoke right. smokestacks, and the smokestacks should be removed. That would be totally irresponsible of me, you know, if I was not also adding to that lifestyle. Right. Um, and that's what we're doing here. So anyway, I'll continue. I, I, I don't disagree. I'm not, I don't want to be, I don't want to be the one that supports. I'm just trying to bring some, I'm some not the one, yeah, I'm not the one to support the metric. Yeah, yeah, I know. No, I know. no. But, if, but if I could, I think we end in the same place. Um, one, the need to um, be informed by better um, statistical research, right. okay, beyond what the state legislature um, has, as noted here, but also irrespective of any of the research that we might do within the state, the, more, the need to have a more diverse teaching staff um, to teach both our young people of color and those who have never experienced a teacher of color and who themselves could benefit from. Yes. Other, um, other questions or thoughts on this um, exciting area? Going once and twice, hearing none. All in favor uh, of the recommendation as approved, uh, say aye. 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 Okay, all opposed? Everybody's in the same. All opposed? <laughs> um, any abstentions? Okay, we have, we have. Wait, how many abstentions? So there's three? That's um, six. Well, there's four votes is required, or five is required for any passage. Five is required, and if we have to, um, if we have to implement this uh, via the department well, because the board doesn't want to make a decision, we'd be happy to do that. Or we could decide um, in December. Michelle, you're comfortable with this? Because I'll vote. I was going to abstain, but if you're comfortable, I'll, I'll vote for it. Well, no, comfortable might be. <laughs> We can change it. I don't see the impact. Why don't we, uh, why don't, why don't, if, uh, if we. We don't have a lot of great impact. All right, let, let, let's, uh, let's retake the vote. Um, do you want a roll call? Uh, yeah, if we could do a roll call, that would be great. Thank you, Meryl. Fecto? <laughs> <laughs> I'll vote for it. You can't yeah. change things. Because first that a, yeah. That yeah. was an I? Yes. Okay. Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. You? Abstain. Ramos Fontini? Yes. Snyder? Abstain. Philly? Abstain. And Albrich is absent. Okay. Four ayes. Uh, four ayes, three abstentions, one, one absent. English learner progress. Um, it did not pass. It did not. Okay. So um, does English, that mean we'll bring it up in December? Um, uh, time, time permitting, yes. Otherwise, the, um, the department will make the decision. Uh, English Learner Progress. Dr. Kiesler. Okay. So moving on to, we are now moving into the five required grades, and this is one of the five. Um, we are required to give schools a grade based on their English Learner Progress, and that is um, the number of students, the percent of English learners who demonstrate proficiency or adequate growth on the English Learner, English Language Learner Assessment, which is the WIDA Access. Um, and in the chart, you see the recommended cut scores. So we would, um, they recommend, these cut scores recommend or would say that any um, school that has between 60 and 100% of its English learners demonstrating proficiency or growth on the WIDA would get an A. Any school with between 45 and 60% um, demonstrating proficiency or growth get a B. 25% of students to 45% of students with proficiency or growth get a C. 10% to 25% would get a D, and any school that had below 10% of their English learners um, demonstrating proficiency or adequate growth would receive an F. Um, using these recommended cut scores, approximately half of the schools eligible for this grade, meaning they have an English learner subgroup, receive either A's or B's, about 30% receive a C, and the remaining 20% receive D's or F's on this component. Um, board, um, could I have a motion to approve the uh, cut scores as noted? So moved. Okay, moved by uh, Trustee Ramos Montini. Other a uh, second. Uh, 
was it? Did you second? No, I was waiting for you. I'll second for, <laughs> for discussion. Second by um, Trustee uh, McMillan. Um, discussion. Yes. First of all, I don't think we're trustees. No. I don't know. I've That's been called a worse. board of trustees, or either <laughs> MSU or U of M or something. But anyway, um, uh, so I, I have. I mean, I I would look to. Uh, this is another area where I don't know if ten percent. I don't know. Is this WIDA test considered um, high stakes? Do we consider it relatively useful? Um, ten percent, or you know, eleven percent, not failing. You know. These percentages are pretty low. I don't know. Um, I'm not too excited about grading schools as it begins with from the state level, but I guess I just, uh, I'd love to hear from. Please. For Mon uh, Ramos Montini or somebody that would have, be a little bit more knowledgeable about these. Well, this test, well, please. This test is the test that's used throughout the state. To assess bilingual students, and it has been effective uh, for placement, uh, for uh, finding out how much English they know, how much of of the culture that they know. How can we assess all of that to be able to service them? So when I was teaching in bilingual ed, this was a test that was useful because a lot of the students uh, didn't know any English, some knew a little bit, some had never gone to school before, but of course they couldn't take it because they, they didn't know how to read and write. But the ones that did know uh, some, you know, some English or none at all, so that gave us an indication where to start with that. I had a question too. Did our so, so it says proficiency or adequate growth. So how much of this is growth and how much proficient? So the, what this is looking for is a student, so to uh, Lupe's point, um, the WIDA is given to any student who's an English learner. They either show that they're proficient on a given year in the WIDA or they show that they're making growth toward that English language proficiency. It's our English language, language proficiency assessment. So this is the percent of students who either got to that proficient mark on the WIDA or showed growth toward that proficient mark. So if, if you have an English learner subgroup and 60 to 100 percent of those students either were proficient or showed growth toward that English language proficiency, you would get an A. Uh, Ms. Ramos Montini. I was going to add that we administer the test before and after. So then we would see the growth. growth. Okay. okay, and Dr. Kiesler, if you could remind uh, the board, we, um, we reviewed this category and the uh, board in small groups suggested some amendments associated therewith. Uh, tell us where uh, where we landed in the distribution with those amendments that were uh, board suggested. Um, the the board expressed um, interest and concern about. Um, I think all the concerns have already been voiced here about using tests to measure students learning and progress and wanting to be fair to schools. So the changes had the impact of um, increasing the range of B schools likely and decreasing the number of C schools um, and decreasing uh, shifted the distribution toward the ABC range um, a bit. So to have more, um, pick up more of the <coughs> progress showed by schools with the grades in a, in a more uh, accessible way for schools. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pritchett. Thank you. Um, there's a limited amount of years that a student may take the WIDA, correct? Yes. If you could kind of review that for us also. Yes. Um, they are required to take the WIDA until they are exited from their English learner status. Andy, are you back here? Tell me if I get anything wrong. Okay. So um, they're required to take it until they exit that English learner status, which is a combination of achieving proficiency on this and being exited by the district. So the district, in making that decision, might have their own internal assessments, observations. Yes. Um, 
So a student might take the WIDA once, mm -hmm. one year, might take the WIDA three years, mm -hmm. depending. Yep. Okay. There's no limit as in you've taken it five years, you have to stop. Right. If you are still considered an English learner, then you still have to take it. Um, in practice, people learn, acquire English, and eventually stop taking it, but we don't say you cannot take it any longer. It takes Please. like three to five years. Yeah, I think this is depending it. on the proficiency. R right, and 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 what we know is is that is that English language learners' um, growth and development is not perfectly linear. It, it, you get a little bit of a Fred. swoop. That's exactly right, and um, it, it's hard to see that movement um, early on the tests. Later, it's more apparent. Um, the the growth shows itself in assessments later than it might with a non-English language learner. Um, that's not unsurprising. It actually kind of mimics the growth um, that you see sometimes in K and one assessments, that um, you see flat early on these assessments and a sharper slope subsequently on the assessments. And that's kind of factored into um, this metric. Again, it's sort of the peril of putting labels on top of labels, isn't it? That um, the percentage of kids making progress is sufficient, and there ought to be some clarity associated with that. But remember, if I'm at a WIDA level one, all it means is, is that I just began to learn the language. It doesn't say anything about my learning ability. It doesn't say anything about my intelligence. Um, if I put anyone in this room in a country in which you didn't know the language, um, you, would, uh, you would struggle without exception, without exception, however smart you may think you are. Uh, but to be dropped in a, in, in, a, in a country where you don't know the language um, is, a, is a challenge. And uh, it does take... Um, a number of years, and um, th three, to, <coughs> three to five for, for some would be the standard. Some would argue five to seven. Yep. The later you come, paradoxically, the, the more years it takes you to get to proficiency, particularly if you come post-puberty, because the literature is pretty clear that your um, linguistic ability, your, your sort of linguistic stickiness, if you will, um, your, your cognitive linguistic stickiness <laughs> is greater when you're small than it is when you're, when you're younger. So my ability to learn French um, was greater when I was small than my ability would be if I went and tried to learn some other language at this advanced age. Okay. Um, other questions or thoughts? Yes, Mr. Uh, McMillan. Just for clarity, uh, for the public, make sure there's no misconception. I and I know that, it, but when uh, Vanessa mentioned like the board wanted, I just I'm very stickler on Open Meetings Act. We did not meet as a majority. We met. I don't know if you explained this before I arrived, but you know we met. You had small groups. You wanted feedback from us. Right. You know, per, nobody said it. You know, I mean, there was no majority that said yes. That's what we want. That's so correct. I just wanted to make it real clear that. Uh, everything is, any decisions are being done out here in public. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly I just, right. I, I, yeah. I know there was no... No, but, but, uh, but the point still stands that we, we um, shared with the board in uh, publicly posted small group sessions, one, two, um, the board members provided feedback. That is not to say that the board as a whole voted in small group session. It's an important distinction that needed to be mentioned. And, and I just you. wanted to mention, if, so if Lupe is fine is, and, and others aren't, uh, uh, concerned about this, I'm, I'm fine with voting yes to this. Any, uh, Dr. Pritchett? It, it just occurred to me that this is the only subgroup that is called out in the legislation. And I always get concerned because we know there are some schools with a large population of EL learners. So you may have 50 students taking the WIDA. And in another school, you may only have 31 taking the WIDA. So I guess I'm getting, again, ahead of myself. 
but I'm wondering if in the descriptor on this one, you know, describing for the reader or the individual looking at these scores, um, that there could be some indication, so because the N becomes extremely important uh, for something like this. Um, yes, because the vast majority of the schools in the state are going to have an NA uh, for this. Right. Uh, yeah. That we have more than 3,000 schools in the state. Uh, most of them are not going to taste, test the requisite number of English learners in order to have this count. That's right. exactly right. And, and I'm concerned that that's going to get misinterpreted if, again, a school has tested 31 students and another school, because they, they have more Yale learners, which is great, has tested 50, you, you get more variation because your N is larger. You do. Um, That's or true. Or smaller, depending on how you look at it. So I'm just, I'm thinking ahead to when this gets rolled out, that we're making it very clear to the public that each one of these has to be looked at in a certain way. So. Fair enough. Okay. Any, anything else for the good of the group on this metric? Um, if not, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, Dr. Kiesler. Okay, moving to our second grade, 205. Beg your pardon. I'm, I'm oh. sorry. Did we have an abstention? Dr. Pugh abstained. I beg your pardon. Thank you. Moving to our second grade, graduation rate. Um, this is the percent of students who are graduating. Um, we use the best of the four-year, five-year, or six-year graduation rate. In practice in Michigan, we track kids up through six years to graduate high school and consider it on-time graduation because we have a number of policy levers that uh, you actually heard one earlier today. Some of those students are uh, in this early middle college are going to be in school for five years and come out with um, college credit and a high school diploma. So our grad rate um, accomplishes that. And so the school gets the credit for the best of their four, five, or six-year grad rate. If a school has between graduates between 93 and 100 percent of its students, uh, we are recommending an A. Between 85 percent and 93 percent of students, a B. 75 to 85 percent, a C. 67 percent to 75 percent, a D. And below 67 percent would be an F. And uh, as we indicated, we appreciated the state board's input on this metric. Um, we had a lot of good discussion in the small group, in the publicly posted small group sessions uh, that the department took into consideration uh, as we show these uh, recommended cut scores. And using these recommended cut scores, we see that there is a U-shaped distribution. So in other words, most schools get an A or a B and have those strong graduation rates. Very few receive Cs or Ds. And then about a quarter receive Fs due to significantly low graduation rates below <laughs> that 67% threshold. And that 67% threshold is the federally recognized Every Student Succeeds Act threshold of 60. Uh, that's the threshold there um, that indicates that a school would be a comprehensive support and improvement school. So that number has an actual grounding in other programming we do. Um, and we thought it made sense to, to keep that consistency. So um, uh, with that shared, if I could have a, a motion to approve the, the cut scores. So moved. So moved by uh, Board Member Ramos Montini. Uh, a second? I'll second. Uh, second uh, by Dr. Pritchett. Discussion? Discussion. Okay. Here, uh, Board Member Tilly. The numbers look pretty stringent. What's the percentages? Um, so about 65% would get a B or an A, and the majority of those would be A's. Um, about 10% get C's or D's, and then, like I said, about a quarter would still get F's. Okay. So ish two-thirds A's or B's, smaller percentage. C's or D's, and then the F, which is associated with that 67% or greater line from ESSA. Yes. So um, if there's a lot of um, mobility 
how so if kids mm. are coming in and out mm -hmm. um, in the schools how is that accounted for and controlled um, so students at the student level are tracked throughout the data system so if they move from this high school to this high school they move their they come out of this high school's grad rate and they go into this high school's grad rate um, so in terms of, there's two aspects of this, right? One is, are you counting them at the right school, not right. the one where they just were, but the one where they are now? Right. That's fairly well handled, and this is a very audited um, number that schools pay a lot of attention to. The other part that's not as well picked up is when a student arrives in 11th grade in your school and doesn't have nearly enough credits. Um, that's why we use the five and six year grad rate. We know that's not a perfect solution, but if you can keep a child in school and on you know working toward the diploma um, that's important but that's more that's not a metric problem that's a uh, kids earning credits in high school in situations that are challenging for them to do so problem which is a different issue other um, other questions dr. Pritchett grad rate does not take into effect GED or does that so if we have a student in 10th or 11th grade who drops out, and then when they're 19 and a half, 20 years old, they actually um, take a GED and pass it, that does not get attributed back to the high school. Does not. GED is not considered a graduation outcome under the graduation rate calculation, which was negotiated with the feds now like 10 years ago, actually, probably. But. So there was a there was a, a change in 2008, 2008 moving forward. There was a uniform calculation of graduation rates because what we had across the country was different states calculating graduation rates in different ways. You couldn't compare um, them. And so there's a uniform calculation for four, five, and six year graduation rates. And so it speaks to how do you treat students with GEDs. That's irrespective of whether you think that that ought to be the case. Right. That's a different conversation. And there are those of us who think, particularly given the fact that the GED standard has risen, mm -hmm. um, there, there are a number of us who, who argue that it ought to count. Um, and, and at some point, um, the feds will get around to that. Ms. Fecto. So the certificates of completion, those are not counted either? So the ones that go on? No, not a certificate of completion. Now, many of our students with disabilities get actual diplomas within the right. five or six year rate. But yes, the students who graduate with a certificate of completion currently are not considered graduates. Okay. And this is something that Scott's been leading a good discussion on, whether or not we think that's appropriate in the future for Michigan. I'm, I might add. It's not counted as dropout or, or. Yeah, it's just a. Nothing, yeah. Yeah, gotcha. it doesn't count against you in terms of your dropout, but it doesn't count for you in terms of your grad rate. Gotcha. Right. We're about to testify in um, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, in front of uh, a Senate committee okay. on a new Michigan Mayor curriculum bill. Um, one of the elements of our testimony is that special needs children um, ought to be able to um, have a, an amended MMC diploma and that it ought not simply to be a certificate of completion, but that you ought to be able to fully graduate um, with modifications that stem from your IEP, from your legally implemented IEP. That would be our recommendation. And we're, we're going to share that in uh, 45 minutes. Um, it's not to say that that's going to be decided in 45 minutes, but that's an important that's an important change that needs to take place in the state. And we do have discretion over that in the state, or more to the point the state legislature does. Um, other, um, Mr. McMillan. Before I vote on this, I'd like to know, so a school that um, I'm gonna agree to that gets an F, does that necessarily mean that's a bad school? That is, uh, I, well, yeah, bad. I mean, is, is failing, the students. Uh, there's other reasons that they could. Are there other reasons legitimately that they could get below a 67? You want to uh, yeah, yeah, please. I mean, it, it, so yes. And what uh, to Dr. Rice's point, we have yet to pull out the alternative ed high schools and the special ed centers, which are the one of the big types of schools that receives a 
uh, has a low grad rate, and some of that is because, as Dr. Pritchett said, um, they may be getting students to GED. Um, special ed centers have a lot of students on certificate of completion. So those are, I would say, legitimate reasons where the data doesn't pick up the fact that a school is getting a child to a good outcome for them. So it's in that sense, it's good that they don't get held accountable on this metric, because this metric is rough for schools that have large populations of students where they're not going to graduate as we define it. Um, aside from those schools, are they bad? A lot of schools, or a lot of students there are not graduating. Now, there can be a host of reasons that students aren't graduating, right? right? And it's not all about what the school is doing. Right. Mm -hmm. In fact, I would argue probably a lot of the time it's less about the school and more about the challenges that student's facing right. in terms of getting to and completing so, I mean, one of the reasons the legislature wanted to do this was to inform parents. They thought this was a great way to inform them. They could be informing them incorrectly in this metric. They could, a parent could say, oh, this, this school doesn't care about graduation rates. Look at this. No, it could be doing a tremendous job trying to get their kids to graduate. It's just there's other circumstances that are causing them to get an F. So this is one of many, a myriad of reasons why I think this stuff just, I, I just, the legislature's, uh, I better not get into adjectives, but I mean, it's just really a problem, and they don't realize what they're doing. It's so, they have, they're such simple-minded in these areas often, and it really upsets me. So we, we, may, have, we may have steered into adjectives, um, but uh, Ms. Tilly and so then Dr. Pugh. What would the ramifications be if we change, if we did an amendment to change the uh, metrics to um, 90 to 100? Ramifications associated um, therewith. Um, it increases the it increases the number getting A's obviously by about ten percent. So before you gave us A and B sixty five percent. So what would that be for A and B? It actually has the effect. It's still sixty five percent across A and B. It just moves, moves some out of the B a. category into the A category. What about the F's? The F is Would that the, affect the, the F's? Nope, unless we change the F cut score. I mean, that's what I mean, the whole flow, change the whole cut Six score. It, it doesn't. If we just change the cut score for A to 90 to 100, the other cuts remain the same. You'd have to change them each. Each of them are a decision. The F that's what you say. 10% of those. 10% in increments. All exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. That would be a less generous. I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you were saying. This? I apologize. Yeah. Um, it reduces the number getting F's by about 4%. And then the total would still be like 21%-ish. Um, getting F's or uh, just over 20%, yeah. I would submit to the board that making a change of that magnitude and breaking the tie to the federal system may not it's not an impactful change, but will have a lot of implications for confusion for the field, where 67% is bad in one system and it's 60 here, and it didn't change your distribution all that much. Just for consideration, think about that. And, and I think part of, the, part of the issue is is that we own this at the end of March when we distribute it. And when it's substantially different, uh, it is owned by you. Uh, that is to say, um, you own those distinctions to the extent that you helped create those distinctions, to the, help, to the extent that there was no ability but to have different systems, that's fine. But to the extent that you exacerbated distinctions between two systems, um, then I think you own that and you need to consider that in your, in your deliberations. This wouldn't change the percentage of Fs very much at all, but it would create some measure of confusion where there was a difference between um, um, a so-called failing school and those not. Where this has particular impact is in the federal system, you would end up being a CSI school. In the state system, you wouldn't necessarily be a comprehensive school improvement school. And so you create, you could just create a really odd circumstance in the, um, in the field with individual schools. That's the only thing I think that Dr. Kiesler was trying to make you aware of. Yeah. Other, um, other thoughts? Oh, wait. Yeah. The CSI schools are based on the index system, right? 
Yes, I said schools are based on the index. Because yes, do you want to share a little additionally? No, I don't want to go into it. I'm just saying that would have nothing to do with whether we change this or not. One of it the would. triggers to be a CSI school is if you have a grad rate below 67%. Oh, right. But I mean, if uh, in these grades we said we changed it, uh, that the school, the same school would still be a CSI school or not, based on whether we change this so they, or not. They could potentially be CSI for grad rate below 67% and getting a D. Right. Yeah. But I mean, it would be different. So let's be clear about this. Uh, um, and I, you know, and I would say also, uh, Dr. Rice, that I, I understand that uh, it's all about incentives, and so I don't want to make it light, you know, make light of the fact that maybe there are schools that aren't doing a good job getting their kids to graduate, and you know, I don't want to be seen as saying, well, I'm, I'm going to give them a little bit. I don't want them to get an F. You know, I, that it's just a bad, it's a bad metric overall for me, because, um, and you know, I don't like uh, kicking it to the department. Uh, you know, I like making decisions, um, and I understand that a decision because of state law has to be made. We can't say, you know, we forbid this one going on, uh, the, the scorecard. So, you know, for me, um, and I don't like the idea of, uh, you know, if we have another month, you know, I'd almost, I'm tempted to say to try to table it and move it to December, but I don't know that another month would get a better result just because it's, it doesn't mean anything in many ways. Just, you know, I mean, it's just... Uh, the, raw, the raw number is the important thing. And the raw number is important and has been reported for years. The four-year rates, the five-year rates, and the six-year rates, if I could finish. Um, the raw data is a part of your data dashboard. Um, it's been a part of your parent dashboard. Right. Um, federally reported, state reported, reported on websites, and so on and so forth. That's the important thing for each individual parent to be able to look at those raw numbers. Not so much the label on top of the number, but rather the raw number. I agree that the label on top of is awkward. I do think that there's a value to a publicly display graduation rates as you have them in the parent dashboard. Yeah, and, and so... Uh I, I would say you, you say that the raw data is important, but again, what we discussed here, a 66 uh, may be of no fault. It may be a, a school that does tremendous work in getting their kids to graduate, but for no fault of their own. And so actually, it is, it is a, it's a harm um, to label them an F and even to get a 66. I mean, I, the raw score at that point, you know, if a parent is comparing, it could be misleading, is all I'm saying, even the raw score, even though it's important, it's to some degree important. So I, as much as I don't want to kick anything to the department, I guess the only thing I'm left with is to, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to, I, I, I'm not, I don't want my fingerprint on this at all, to be honest with you. I, I mean, to either say no or to abstain. Seems like okay. the right one for me. All right, fair enough. So um, if, if I, um, if, uh, hearing uh, any more conversation, Dr. Pugh. You know, I, I guess I'll, I'll just lay it here why I've up, abstain, abstain from and will continue to. Um, I don't want to own any of this. You know, I, we all know that I'm, I'm just going to put it out there. You know, the department is to be commended for trying to uh, not rush something through that was rushed through at the 11th hour without, obviously without thought. Um, we know this because it's created two separate systems um, for the department to try to uh, engage the department or the, the board uh, to keep us um, um, in tune with, with what you're doing for all the work that Vanessa, that you're doing to try to, to make sense out of nonsense. That's, that's all to be commended. I just don't want my fingerprints on any of this. I mean, to me, um, this may be where you and I separate, Tom, um, but it, it perpetuates racism and classism. Uh, these numbers mean nothing. They're based on uh, senseless measures that just should not. It's senseless to, to take measures and be, uh, that, that just victimize victims. Um, when you talk about the graduation rates, and that's what I was talking about, if, if I were as a scientist or researcher, public health person, to just take some descriptive numbers and then base my uh, decisions on that, I would be laughed at 
and especially by the people who created uh, this legislation that's driving this nonsense. It's just not good science. And when I look at public health, when I look at education and our children, those are some of the most critical areas where we cannot afford to just continue to be a part of the perpetuation of the nonsense and victimizing victims. And so I just, I refuse to be a part of it. I don't want my name on it. I do understand the department and why you all are having to do what you're doing. And I, I don't criticize my board members for making sure that they have the back of the department. Uh, what you're doing here is not what has slowed down this process. You doing your due diligence is to be commended because it was rushed through and us having this conversation is not what is slowing down what really shouldn't, shouldn't exist. Uh, but just wanted to get that out there. Very much. Anything um, additionally um, before, we, um, before we vote? Um, okay. Um, graduation rates, cut scores, um, as noted on the table. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, one. All opposed. Uh, abstentions. Pamela. Okay. Let's do a roll call vote, please, Marilyn. Bechtel. Abstain. McMillan. Abstain. Pritchett. Abstain. Pugh. Abstain. Ramos Montini. Yes. Schneider. Abstain. Philly. Abstain. Albert Jackson. Very good. One aye. The um, thank you very much. It is 11.40. Um, we have just a few more minutes. Let's, um, let's just share um, without vote, if we could, um, what we have in terms of recommendations on the next um, three categories. Uh, no vote, no discussion, given time constraints, if we could. Um, and that permits uh, the board to fully consider it in advance of the December board meeting. Okay? All right, very good. Dr. Kiesler. So moving on to grade three, proficiency. Uh, you see the chart in front of you. This is another metric that we've had a good deal of discussion about. So at this time, these are the cut scores that we would recommend to the board. Um, if between 55 and 100% of your students are proficient, uh, you would receive an A, 40 to 55% a B, 23 to 40% a C, 10% to 23% a D, and if below 10% of your students are proficient, you would receive an F. Just a reminder that this combines math and ELA. That was a vote the board took at the October board meeting, and that the state average in general floats somewhere between 40 and 50%. Um, and um, similar to the previous metric, the board provided significant feedback on, on the proficiency grade. When we use these cut scores, we would see that a little over half of schools are projected to receive an A or a B, about 25% receive a C, and the remaining 20% receive Ds or Fs. Dr. Rice, you want me to continue to the other ones? Please, yeah. Moving on to growth, um, and I know that this has been discussed already today. There has been substantial interest and discussion regarding the best ways to measure student growth at the student level and then how to credit schools for the growth um, that students demonstrate on assessments, on state assessments. At this point, for the first year of A to F, we recommend that we use the current growth calculation and concurrently we will convene a stakeholder group to discuss the various options for modifying this metric in the future. If we use the current metric, um, and now moving on to the cut score. So using the current way of measuring growth, which is we look at the number of students, the, the percent of students in a school who demonstrate adequate growth, meaning they're growing toward proficiency. So they're not just growing at all, they're growing enough that they will get to proficient, or if they are proficient, that they will stay proficient over time. Using that as the student level metric, um, you count the number of students in a school who demonstrated the adequate growth, and then you divide by the total, and you get a percent of students demonstrating adequate growth. The recommended cut scores at this point would be if your school has between 55 and 100 percent of your students demonstrating adequate growth, you would get an A, 40 to 55 percent a B, 25 to 40 percent a C, 10 to 25 percent a D, and below 10% is an F. And you can see these cuts look similar to the proficiency cuts because the distributions are similar and the logic remains constant across both. 
If we use these cut scores, around 50% of schools would receive A's and B's on growth. Approximately a third would receive C's and the remaining 20% receiving D's and F's. Moving into our final metric. And Dr. Rice alluded to this earlier in the meeting, and we, this was another area where we've had very rich discussion around this comparison to similar schools. So what the law requires is that schools be graded on how well they do in proficiency compared to schools who look like them. So we've had a lot of discussion around how to match, what does it mean to look like each other um, as a school. And to be responsive to this feedback, the MDE proposes we change the matching methodology to be based 70% on the percent of students who receive free lunch. And that's free lunch, not economically disadvantaged. And again, we had a good discussion about that um, at the board table last month. 20% um, based on the percent of students with disabilities in the school. And then 10% on what's essentially school size, or, but is calculated as student FTE. So in other words, your similar schools would be those with similar percents, largely driven by the percent of free lunch, and then by how many students with disabilities you have, and then just by your size. Yes. A quick question. I thought it was, <clears throat> I, 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 I like this. Um, I thought we had talked about 20%, the 20% would be with the FTEs. It is. I apologize. Okay. I, okay. That should say that. All right. Thanks. And then... Finally, so we do the match based on those three factors. We find your similar schools, and then you as a school are compared to um, for the performance in that, in that group. And it, that is expressed as a Z-score. Z-scores range from three, which means you're extremely above average, to negative three, extremely below average. Although in practice, most go from one to negative one. Um, if you have a zero, you're no different than the average in your group. So again, this metric is all about how well do you do in proficiency compared to schools that look just like you. So the cut scores here are if you have a z-score, essentially, of above 0.89, meaning you're above average, you would get an A. If you're 0.48 to 0.89, you would get a B. If you cross zero, so you see the C range is from negative 1.5 to 0.48, so that means zero, that means you're right at the average, is in the middle of that band, you'd get a C, meaning you're right on kind of the average of the group. Um, if you have a Z-score of 0.84 to 0.15, um, you would get a D, that should be point negative 0.15, negative 0.15, I apologize. And then below uh, negative 0.84, you would get an F. And using these cut scores, about 30% of schools receive A's and B's, about 30% receive a C, and the remaining 40% receive D's and F's. The board, there was conversation, you recall, about this particular way of comparing schools. And um, I think this metric, more than many of the metrics, um, is a little bit more comfortable for us as a, as a team when you think about it because we are comparing to the extent possible likes to likes, um, similars to similars. So I think that there's some value to this. Of course, it turns on the formula, it turns on that pie, doesn't it? And so you suggested a greater percentage uh, based on economic disadvantage. Um, we incorporated that. Um, you also suggested that a percentage be associated with um, percent of special needs children. We incorporated uh, that. You now have a metric that's almost exclusively um, uh, the one or the other, either economic disadvantage and substantial economic disadvantage in free lunch or um, a percent of students with disabilities. Ninety percent of the comparison is driven by those two factors very different from the initial in which student FTE was fully half of this and uh, percentage of special needs children was unnoted uh, in it. You also may recall that economic disadvantage was ever so slightly uh, differently defined. Um, it was defined as free and reduced price lunch eligible, not simply, not free lunch eligible. So you have a little bit um, greater um, severity of economic disadvantage that gets calculated within, within this. Um, we think that these are good changes. Um, interestingly enough, um, they, they, 
they, they produce some pretty similar results. And so that has um, gotten us wondering about uh, what gets captured in the student FTE metric. And so we're going to go back to um, some, some people that use that metric and kind of really flesh that through um, to, the extent that we, um, to the extent that we can. Questions on the rethinking of comparison to similar schools? Questions on that? Any thoughts associated there with? No, but yes. no, uh, I didn't know. We didn't have that opportunity to have questions on the other two. Uh, no, I so beg I, your I know pardon. you're hurried, but I just wanted to say that the I like the stakeholder group on the modifying the growth metric. What I want to make sure that is on the record from MDE is that that we can change this. I don't want to come next year and they say and and hear that well things are you know it would be too much of a seismic shift to change that. We, I mean, you you really believe that there could be a change if, you know, the stakeholder group and this board thinks that it should be, the way we measure growth should be changed. Yes. Okay. Uh, but I want to be clear, we're not going to have that conversation no, in the fall. I understand. We're going to have that conversation January through right. um, April or May. I'm a little more comfortable and, and with, yeah. with that. But yeah, and, and we are too. We think that there's some value to that conversation, um, probably long overdue. But it's going to be the next few months um, so that um, we're able to get on a different time frame moving forward. Yes. Um, other, um, other thoughts? I might add, I think a lot of this is, um, is flexible, particularly if we're prepared to uh, re-engage uh, with the feds, um, to not re-engage with the feds is to um, have two very, very different systems. And again, you can't have it both ways. You can't argue against A through F because you don't think that there should be two very separate systems and then create a second system that is very different from the first system. You have to choose. Um, you, can't, you, you, can't get, uh, you can't have both arguments um, at, the, um, at the same time. So more on that to reflect upon. My only point is, um, there's been a wide level of discretion um, this go-round, and uh, to your specific question, Mr. McMillan, we are happy in the next four months um, to engage in a significant conversation about how growth is calculated. Okay? All right. Um, any other uh, benedictions for the good of the group? Ms. Tilly. Going back to the high school graduation rates. Yes. And just thinking about, I mean, you guys have to comply. So it, it has to, it's law. So you have to do it. Um, and we all know that there are factors that contribute. Yes. Can you add that on there? Can, can you can, add some of the factors? Yes. And, and I think what we would like you to, um, to help us with is that um, that caveat or that disclaimer at the end that essentially helps contextualize um, these metrics or individual metrics as the case may be. We're happy to share with you a draft of that, get your feedback. Um, group, um, uh, group editing is a little bit uh, perilous, um, but we, uh, we welcome it at least initially. Um, so we do think that there's some value to that. That would help with the contextualization, assuming that people read um, those, um, those sorts of things. I know that there are some that do, many that don't. Um, and quite frankly, I think um, for a lot of people, this is the, the whole conversation uh, around this topic is in the weeds for a lot of people. Yes, Dr. Pugh. Um, to Tiffany's point, and then you mentioning contextualiza contextualization, um, can, do you see us doing more with the data? Maybe not we, but is there any way that more can be done with the data other than a disclaimer in that some, some, some more in-depth, robust statistical analysis can be done with this data uh, that will provide some, some actual a real uh, contextualization, empirical. I think, I, I think so, yes. I do think more can be done with the data. I think that there's, there's a lot of noise in the data. 
Um, I think that given the noise in the data, it leads to some challenging conclusions. I do think that there's good research on factors that drive higher student achievement or higher right. Um, right. higher numbers rather than lower. Um, we have those. Uh, we have that research. I've encouraged our research partners from Michigan State and University of Michigan to help us create research briefs for our teachers, for our administrators in our local school districts to help us understand those major factors. A number of us can share those uh, verbally, but they'd be nice to have in single page, double page, um, out to the field with a lot of footnotes. So if you want to click on the study itself, see exactly what that study was, you can read it in its entirety. Right, and we, we've all studied all of the data that exists, but if there's some primary data, something that we can contribute to the body of the science from our data, um, that's beyond a disclaimer. That's, yeah. that's No, I understand. It's, it's a good question. I think it's worth an effort. I don't know that our data, given some of the factors that exist uniquely in Michigan around school funding, and the adverse impact of school funding that isn't equitable. And so um, what you have is school districts that have some of the greatest needs receiving um, dollars which are the furthest away from those needs. And that obscures a lot of other things that are going on within the data. And that's exactly what I'm talking yeah. about. Can, can we run some data that shows that, that I'm able to see, like, what are some of the confounding factors that end up with this outcome? That, that's exactly. Right. So, so it's a question that I've asked. I think that there's some value to it. Um, I have some question about how muddy the data will be when we, when we do the regression analysis. But we're happy to, bless you, we're Thank happy you. to work on it um, and to involve you if you'd like to be involved in it, because I think that would be helpful to have a different set of eyes, a research set of eyes, albeit a research set of eyes coming at it from, from the healthcare profession rather than necessarily from the education profession. Okay. Um, anything more? If not, we are adjourned until uh, 1 p.m. Thank you.